That was music for the ears. It's so tough for a Toronto artist to get proper funding. It's so tough. But a matter of fact, the Canadian Music Fund has been donating over $27 million for the last five years to help out independent camera artists. Um, however, you know, that puts a setback for diverse genres. Exactly. So that would mean like the Lansdowne Quartet. Just like them. But we're talking even bigger orchestras, ones that already have thousands of dollars. But you know what? They have first priorities for these grants. But guess what, gang? Hope is not lost, because still on the journal to come, we still got Josh Meles, who's still going to be here to give us some of our some photography freelance points. And we still got jewelry designer Jackie Halston coming in. And don't forget, poetry artist Rashid Akeem will be right here in the studio to show us some of his work. So, in a bit later. Meet Josh Meles, photographer extraordinaire. On this segment of the show, we're going to be exploring what he does on a daily basis. I graduated from political science at York University, and uh, I, I took that degree uh, because uh, I found it really interesting, people's interactions, and uh, I saw it as like an interesting system to explain how the world works. There was a point where I was uh, literally just walking around thinking, uh, about my day and about you know what the rest of my days might look like and um, it occurred to me that photojournalism would be an interesting uh, career choice and maybe even a viable one for me. Photographers they work on their own and uh, you know you can look through the viewfinder with both eyes open it's very helpful um, you know to see what's going on around you so that you know something isn't going to bump into you or you into something else and, you know, keep your eye open, see what's going on, maybe, uh, you know, see what's about to walk into your frame. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, like, think about that street back, lean a little bit toward you. Okay. Eventually, I uh, ended up living and working in uh, Israel and was working for uh, an agency, a couple different agencies at different times, other times is working uh, completely as freelance. Um, and uh, seeing that was, uh, was fascinating, very, very interesting um, to see how people behaved in situations where uh, there was intense conflict going on with, uh, with guns or with mortars or tanks um, or sometimes even just with like rocks and slingshots. Um, and it was really, really interesting uh, to see how daily life would continue um, for these people. Lisa, isn't it interesting how Josh Mellis is able to transition from war photography over to the urban se setting so nicely? Yeah, I mean, moving from the surroundings of war into concrete jungle really should be easy. I mean, especially during rush hour downtown. That's a bit hectic. Of course, it's crazy down there, especially with all those cars. It really is a war scene. They're dodging and weaving out of traffic. But you know what else is crazy, Lisa? What else is crazy, Mikhail? The Nui Blanche show. I was down there this I was down there this year and it was thousands of people had the streets packed. I mean everywhere. The art exhibit was crazy. But we got an insight with Alessia Peluso who went down by City Hall to give us an insight on the gigantic light show that took place and also give us an interview with light designer David Turian. For one sleepless night, the city is transformed by more than 500 artists to celebrate Toronto's fourth annual Contemporary Art Festival. We're here at the corner of Dundas and McCall where we're going to start our tour around the city for 2009's Nuit Blanche. Blanche is an annual all-night arts festival. The idea of a nighttime festival has spread around the world since 1997. At Nuit Blanche, you can find museums, private and public art galleries, and other cultural institutions open and free of charge, 
with the center of the city itself being turned into an art gallery, providing space for installations, performances, themed social gatherings, and other activities. In 2006, Nuit Blanche came to Toronto, attracting around 450,000 people. This year, it is expected to almost double that. The downtown core is divided into three zones, each one representing a theme made up by 40 different projects. Everyone's just out in Toronto having fun. The weather is nice. When I see all this stuff, it gets me interested into art. It's live everywhere. I was here last year. I was at Young and Dundas Square last year. Everywhere is just live and it's good. Look at every all the Torontonians just happy. Every year, there is one main attraction for the whole festival. This year, it is David Terrian's beautiful light four-letter word machine at Nathan Phillips Square. Light's kind of a, it's an elemental force, and in these pieces the last few years, to me, it uh, it kind of has represents this purity and life force in the body. It's something that, in sheer intensity, in its sheer purity, in its absolute white form, uh, obliterates everything else. Then I try to use it in a way that's intimidating at times. It puts you into a situation where the light is so powerful, it's almost threatening. If you missed this year's Wave Launch, be sure to check it out next October. And thanks, Alessia, for that report from Nuit Blanche. That really was a labor of love, you know? It's not like that you get to see great artwork every single day. And you know what? It's so hard to put it all together, Lisa. But when you put it all together, it's usually nothing short of spectacular. Right, and there's a lot of work that goes into creating a light show. A lot of work. But guys, don't take your hands off that play button just yet. Because coming up, we still get a first-hand look at independent jeweler designer Jackie Halstead. And of course, we still have Rashida Kim here in the studio. So keep it on play with The, the Journal. journal. My name is Jackie Holstead, and I am a jewelry designer from Toronto. About 15, 20 years ago, when I got a job at a um, jewelry company slash museum, well, it was more like an art gallery. And I went there, and at first I was a little scared, because who thinks they can make jewelry? And then when I realized that people, I was making things, and people were buying them, I knew I was on to something. I rekindled my passion 15 years later, and this is the result. Um, this stuff I made a year ago, and uh, I'm really happy with myself. My last inspiration is uh, by a man named Art Smith, and he is a really big inspiration, and I think I'm gonna start paying more attention to him and learning as much as I can about him. I play around with asymmetrical and the other day I was doing some market research and people saw that my work had an asymmetrical look to it. And I thought to myself, well, I've succeeded in people knowing what I'm about. I was very fortunate to go on last summer. I went there to volunteer, but when I went to Ghana, I realized that there was so much more to offer um, in terms of my growth as a woman and my growth as an artist. Um, I found the colors refreshing and um, at that time I could really see the true beauty of black women. Usually when people see it, they like it and they buy it. Uh, but I know I can't rely on luck and I have to be very um, strategic in how I pursue the jewelry making and how I sell the jewelry. And um, I want the jewelry to be sold online. I want the jewelry sold in, um, you know, at parties because I know that the parties work and I've been told by women that as long as they have the time, they will go to the parties. So that's my biggest problem making sure people have the time. To I don't make anything that I see on the road. I don't make anything that I see, you know, in stores. 
you know, of course I have to be mindful of what other people are doing, use the colors that are, you know, in for the season. 